Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Otem and today we'll talk about intabulations in the 16th and 17th centuries. Nowadays, when we want to examine some music, we find its modern score and take a look at it. We don't need to perform it or play a recording of it in order to get an idea of the music, we can just look at it. All the parts are laid out one on top of the other in a way that allows us to examine the music. However, such a score was not so common in the 16th and 17th centuries. Full scores, or in Italian partiture, were a rather rare thing, used mainly for educational purposes or especially complex keyboard music. Singers used only their individual part books. Lutenists and keyboard players, however, made their own arrangements of the pieces. These arrangements were called intabulations, and they were made using different kinds of notation systems that were designed for that purpose. In this episode, we'll explore the different ways music was notated. Let's start. Since the beginning of polyphonic music, one of the common ways of communicating it was using the choir book format. The different parts of a piece were laid out on a rather large page, each in its own corner. The idea was that the singers would stand around the book and read their respective voices. In this publication from 1562, we see that the superior part, the highest part, and the tenor part are on the left page, and the altus and basus parts are on the right page. Although all the notes of the piece are laid out in front of us, in order to grasp the music, we must perform it. For example, if I'm looking at the bass part, and I want to know what happens in the other voices when I sing the text Dimisit in Anes, I have no immediate way to find that out. Looking at the places with the same text in the other voices will surely not be the answer, as in many styles the voices rarely sing the text together. As there are no bar lines, the only way would be to count breves from the beginning of the piece in each of the voices. But even now, when we have found out where the place in question is in each of the voices, it is still not so easy to see how the voices work together. So, although all the parts are here, they are still separate from one another, and still far from representing the music as an integral whole as immediately as a modern score does. It was simply not meant for this purpose, it was meant for performing it. More common than the choir book format, and by far the most common way of communicating music during the 16th century, was by means of separate part books. In essence, it is the same as a choir book, only that each part is bound in a different little book. In this way, the singers don't need to stand close to each other, and it's possible to have music with many more voices and instruments. The disadvantage is that the music is now scattered in different little books, and unfortunately, there are many cases of part books that have gotten lost over the years. Both formats, the choir book and the part book, were meant mainly for performance purposes, and are not so friendly when it comes to inspecting the music. In order to do that, we have to make an open score out of the separate parts, but as we said, this was not done so often. A common procedure done by instrumentalists was to prepare intabulations from the different parts. This was done using different kinds of notation systems. Let's see. Practically speaking, making intabulations is putting the music into tablatures. There are different kinds of tablatures, such as the Italian lute tablature, the French lute tablature, the Spanish keyboard tablature, the German one, and of course the Italian one, which developed into the modern keyboard notation. In most of these notation methods, the complete polyphonic data of the separate voices cannot be contained. Some information is lost, in some methods more than others. To demonstrate that, Let's see how the opening of the madrigal Ancor che col partire by Cipriano de Rore was intabulated using the different methods. But let's first check what the original 1550 part books look like. For our convenience, here is a modern score. Let's sing this opening quickly. Now 
now that we know it more or less, let's have a look at an intabulation by Antonio Di Vecchi, as printed in his Libro Primo d'Intabulatura d'Aliuto from 1568. This numerical lute tablature, also known today as the Italian lute tablature, is very simple. The six lines represent the six courses of the lute, having the top line as the lowest course. The notes are represented by numbers that indicate which fret must be stopped, having zero as an open course, one as the first fret, and so on. Lastly, the rhythm is indicated by signs above the tablature. Each sign applies until it is replaced by another sign. The so-called French lute tablature is almost the same, only that the numbers are replaced by letters and that the courses are arranged in a reverse order. Back to Ancorche Col Partire. Let's see what its lute intabulation looks like when transcribed literally. The challenge that this efficient notation system brings when dealing with polyphonic music is that it's hard to differentiate between the different parts. There is no indication to which part each note belongs to. Are we looking at several parts or just one weird melody? Furthermore, there is no way to indicate the independent rhythms of each part. There are no ways to prolong a note and there is no way to stop a note. It's as if the system says, forget the details, we'll just tell you what note to pluck at what point and the music will appear. And this is quite true. For example, in this case, and thanks to the nature of the lute, the two original parts are played on different courses. So while the second voice is joining, the first one still sounds and creates the illusion of two independent parts. Like so, the actual outcome sounds quite close to the original polyphony. Now, let's see the same musical excerpt in an intabulation made by the blind organist Antonio de Cabezon from roughly the same time. On the title page of this publication, it says that it is meant for keyboard, harp and vihuela, a Spanish plucked instrument. Although on the surface it seems similar to the Italian lute tablature, it includes more details of the polyphony. Each line represents a part of the composition, in this case four parts. Thus, it is possible to differentiate between the parts easily. In addition, there are signs for rests and a sign that allows you to prolong notes. Check the footnote for a more detailed explanation of this system. Here you can see a literal transcription of the first bars of this tablature. Thanks to the prolongation signs, the top line is now rhythmically just like the original. The second voice still requires some imagination to complete, but since now it's clear that it is an independent part, it's much simpler. In the next bars there are still things that seem a bit odd in the literal transcription, but with some experience one learns how to interpret them. Until now, we discussed only things that got lost during the intabulation process. The disadvantages of the intabulations compared with the complete original parts. But there are things that appear only in the intabulations and not in the original parts. Let's see. The process of intabulation was rarely only a dry attempt to transfer the music onto another medium. The intabulations often include elements of performance practice that normally do not appear in the original notation, but were definitely there in the actual performance. These elements include ornamentation and the alteration of notes according to the practice of musica ficta. With regards to ornamentation, there is not much to say. Some intabulations include florid ornamentation and some light. In any case, not having any ornamentation is very rare, a thing which is normally found only in the original pure parts. The interpretation of musica ficta is a more tricky subject. Very briefly, from the beginning of polyphony, some written notes were expected in performance to be altered chromatically, G to G sharp, B to B flat, etc. 
Most often, musica ficta is applied to cadences, to make the cantitans sound the way it is expected to. But sometimes it is applied in order to avoid dissonant intervals with other parts. Otherwise, it seems that musica ficta was also applied freely according to the taste of the performer. In the version of Cabesson, for example, the F on the first phrase was altered to F sharp. In the original and in many other intabulations, it sounds like that. But in Cabesson's version, it sounds like that. And another part that originally sounds like that. In Cabesson's version, sounds like that. Many modern scholars are interested in finding definite rules concerning musica ficta along the different periods, but the musical reality, as seen in the contradicting sources, seem to resist such a solution. Sure, there are alterations that are more common than others, and Cabesson's version is quite exceptional, but those tiny alterations seem to be more important to scholars who want to be correct in their editions than to any musician or listener who just enjoys the variety of possibilities. So, it seems that the intabulations in general are not just another way of notating the same thing, they are a bit closer to the music as it should be actually performed, with ornamentation and interpretation of musica ficta. Thus, when working on pieces, it's good to look for additional intabulations, as they may give some hints or inspiration in these fields. Now, skipping the German lute tablature that you can read about in the footnotes, let's have a look at the Italian and German keyboard notation systems. Starting in the 1530s, we see prints in the so-called Italian keyboard in tavolatura. This notation is basically mensural notation as we know it from choir books and part books, only that it is set on two staffs, one for the right hand and another for the left. In the different publications, we see varying number of lines on each staff, from five, as with normal vocal staves, up to many more. Here is Ancor che col partire in an intavolatura by Andrea Gabrieli. Although it is similar to common mensual notation, we also have problems here in communicating the complete details of the polyphony. This particular opening is fine, clearer than the tablatures we looked at before, but still, this notation has difficulties. The lack of consistent rests in the different parts and consistent system for the direction of the stems make it very hard at times to differentiate between the parts, especially in the common case of voice crossings. So although it seems almost like modern notation in an old font, it is still closer to the tablature in spirit a mere instruction indicating which key to strike when. Now, while many adopted and used the Italian intavolatura, in Germany they did something completely different. In the second half of the 16th century, the new German organ tablature was introduced. It replaced the old German organ tablature, which we won't discuss on this occasion. Here we once again have Ancor che col partire in an intabulation by Bernhard Schmidt from 1607. Like the Spanish tablature, also here we have four lines for four voices. However, every voice has its own signs for rhythm, a feature very much lacking in other systems. In fact, apart from having the text, it is as accurate as a full score made from the original parts. This system was so effective that it stayed in use in Northern Europe well into the 18th century. Even Bach used it when he ran out of space. Check the footnotes for more details about this system. So, more than any other system, the new German tablature was accurate enough to express the complete details of polyphony. Thus, there are many surviving German tablatures 
that are not arrangements of pieces at all. They accurately communicate polyphonic pieces as they are, just like a score in the modern sense. But why would Italians use a German system? They did something else. Let's see. When Italian composers wanted to communicate music which was polyphonically complex to a single reader, pieces in which each voice is very much independent from the others in its rhythms and range, they could not use the intavolatura, they had to use the partitura. Here again we see an corche col partire in one of the earliest printed partiture. The partitura is almost like a modern open score, where the parts are on top of one another and locked within bar lines. It was first used mostly for educational purposes, as it was one of the few ways one could actually see the music as a whole, as opposed to an individual part or an arrangement. This specific and rather rare case was made for playing, but also for the purpose of studying counterpoint and it was not meant only for keyboard instruments, but for ogni sorte di strumento perfetto, any kind of perfect instrument, that is, an instrument that can play polyphony. Now, this impressive partitura is rather challenging to read. Not only does each voice have a different clef, within a single bar the notes are not graphically aligned. It seems, however, that there were times when this kind of notation was frequently used, but we only learn about them retrospectively. In 1619, Bernardo Strozzi wrote that it's possible to play all the parts accurately from a partitura, but it's very difficult, and that the people who could do that are either dead or very old. The famous composer and keyboard player Girolamo Frescobaldi, excluding his toccatas, published all his music in partitura format. In 1624, he wrote that his capricci might be difficult to play, because many had abandoned the practice of performing from score. In 1635, in the preface for his famous Fiori Musicali, he wrote that practicing reading from scores is very important, and that it might distinguish the true virtuosi from the ignorant. An interpretation of his statement might be that using the score differentiates those who see and understand the music from those who just play the right notes at the right time. So, this was our show about intabulations. We hope you enjoyed it. Many thanks to Ryosuke Sakamoto for his knowledge and for playing the lute, and for my friends at Profeti della Quinta for their singing. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. Feel free to comment, share and like and see you next time at earlymusicsources.com.